For over 300 years, this fine colonial house at Saugus has witnessed the changes in the Massachusetts seasons. If its ancient beams could talk, what a story they could tell. As we visit the house today, we can but imagine the time when it served as the home of America's first iron master. Before this very fireplace, New England's earliest settlers dreamed of the day when America would meet its own needs for iron. The centuries passed. The ironworks became only a memory. But the Iron Master's house was such an impressive monument to one of America's first industries that in 1942 it was purchased with plans to move it board by board to Greenfield Village in faraway Michigan. And then in the office of the Saugus Town Assessor, the proverbial New England conscience was awakened. Miss Louise Hawks, descendant of a 1630 settler, noted the sale of the Iron Master's house and determined that its ancient beams would not be moved from their hallowed place. She aroused the town of Saugus and the state of Massachusetts. The Iron Master's house was saved for New England. In March 1943, a meeting was held at the headquarters of the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, and the first ironworks association was formed. It was resolved that the colonial ironworks would be restored. But the original aspects of the ironworks had long since disappeared. What once had been the busiest industrial site in America was now the nesting place of meadowlarks and cat birds. Yet here, to the knowing eye, was the slag pile, and beneath the topsoil, there must be other evidences of the past. To explore the site, J. Sanger Atwill, president of the association, interested archaeologist Roland Robbins in making preliminary excavations and thus began one of the most amazing archaeological stories in the annals of America. Within a month, the foundation stones of the original blast furnace had been unearthed. Sensing the importance of the project, American Iron and Steel Institute agreed to underwrite the cost of restoring the iron works. From the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the services of Professor E. N. Hartley, were enlisted to search the written records for facts and figures concerning the old iron works. The records of the Winthrop family were an important source of information, for it was the son of the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop Jr., who organized the Company of Undertakers for the Iron Works in New England. Faded early American records are often difficult to decipher, but if you are familiar with Elizabethan writing, Strange lines take on familiar meaning. At the ironworks, great things were taking place. Only a foot below the surface was found the 500-pound iron hammerhead, which 300 years ago had forged wrought iron from pig iron produced by the furnace. Here was the hammerhead used to beat out iron for America's first homes. Iron to dig with. Iron to saw with. Iron hatchets. Pliers. Spikes. Weights. Cannonballs. Hammerheads. And wedges. Three tons of artifacts were found during the first year of archaeological work. The Lynn Public Library displays the famous Saugus Pot, which, according to tradition, was the first casting made at the ironworks. Tradition and fact are often worlds apart. So a spectroanalysis was made of both the iron in the pot and the iron found at the ironworks. Their chemical composition was found to be identical. Tradition was fact. Archaeology is an exacting science. Great care must be taken or the story that the earth has to tell may be forever lost. 
the modern archaeologist can use newly developed electronic devices to point out the location of buried objects. And in experienced hands, a metal probing rod is a very reliable guide. Test trenches dug throughout an area provide a remarkable insight into the past. The wall of a test trench gives a cross-section of history. Here, for example, is the surface level of the 1890s, the 1800s, the 1700s, and the 1640 outline of the waterway which led to the furnace water wheel. The age of each level is determined by a study of the artifacts which are found in it, like this shovel, a colonial shoe, a metal spoon, a piece of pottery, Indian relics. Explorations were carried into the surrounding countryside. The waterway was traced to the old dam site. Historical records tell of the destruction of the dam in 1678. In following the course of old waterways, the archaeological crew enlisted the cooperation of the people of Saugus, for excavations often closely approached the homes of today. Finding the Twer pipe, through which air from the bellows was fed into the blast furnace, provided important facts on which to base the reconstruction of the bellows. The location of the original timbers which formed the base of the bellows convinced archaeologist Robbins that below the pavement of Central Street lay the position of the water wheel which had activated the bellows. The town of Saugus cooperated and Central Street was rerouted around the ironworks. 21 feet beneath the pavement, the 17th century water wheel was found the 40% section still intact showed that the old wheel was 16 feet in diameter and had 50 buckets. Reconstruction of the furnace was undertaken using some of the very stones with which the original furnace had been built. Working from plans based on the archaeological findings, skilled stonemasons soon completed the key structure and finished it in authentic colonial style. The Saugus Furnace once again stood against the New England sky, a dramatic tribute to pioneers of America's iron and steel industry. After the stonework came the woodwork. Great oak beams were carefully hewn into shape in the time-honored manner. Modern craftsmen learned to use the tools of their forefathers. Against the background of the Iron Master's house, beams for the bridge to the furnace were cut to size. The bridge connected the embankment with the top of the furnace so that the charge of ore and charcoal could be dumped into the furnace. From faraway Maryland, a great oak was brought to Saugus for the shaft of the furnace water wheel. Even with modern equipment, handling this giant tree was a problem. But it was soon trimmed down to proper shape painted with a protective coat of creosote and swung into place beside the furnace. The furnace water wheel was reconstructed to precise measurements obtained from the original water wheel and joined to the shaft in the wheel pit. At the 1952 annual meeting of the first Iron Works Association, the reconstructed water wheel first turned under its own power but it was not idle power, for it activated the reconstructed bellows to supply blasts of air necessary for the furnace. To complete the furnace unit, the roof over the bellows and casting beds was reconstructed. Meanwhile, the archaeological crew had not been idle. To carve down the land to its original contour, large mechanical shovels were used. A dam was constructed along the banks of the Saugus River so that the site of the original dock could be explored. Essential working parts of the old ironworks were found below the present level of the Saugus River, providing further proof that New England's coastal land is gradually sinking into the sea. Work was carried on in all seasons, and many tons of earth were carefully moved. 
The forge area, where the giant hammerhead had been found, was carefully charted. The anvil bases were still in their 17th century position. Evidence was unearthed on which could be based the reconstruction of the forge, the slitting mill, and outlying buildings. Nature's camouflage was removed from the slag pile, which reached from the furnace to the river. Beside the slag pile, where the furnace tail race had once run its course, old records indicated that Joseph Jenks had worked his forge and planned the machine for which he was awarded the first industrial patent in America. In the winter of 1952, this area was opened up. Once the archaeological crew struck pay dirt, neither snow nor sleet could keep them from unlocking the secrets of the past. In the Jenks area, the remains of three water wheels were found. They were carefully removed for preservation in the museum adjoining the Iron Master's house. The removal of old timbers was a delicate process. Each piece was handled with loving care. The great detective story in unearthing the facts regarding America's first large industrial enterprise was nearing its end. Facts fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle, one authenticating another. The basic archaeological work was done, and the architects Perry, Shaw, and Hepburn, Keogh, and Dean, famous for their reconstruction of colonial Williamsburg, now had the facts necessary to guide them in planning the restoration. The forge where iron from the furnace was worked into usable forms was reconstructed on its original site. The large water wheels on each side of the forge building rivaled the furnace water wheel in size. Above each hearth, the wooden framework of a chimney reached into the sky. Between the uprights, wicker work served as a lath for the plaster with which the chimney was lined. The forge, the furnace, and the slitting mill, the essential units in the first ironworks reconstruction, now stand once again on the banks of the Saugus. Starting with the Iron Master's house, the pond and slag pile, the archaeologists plotted the courses of the old waterways and uncovered the location of the furnace, the forge with its giant hammer, the slitting mill, and other ironworks buildings. Here is the Saugus Ironworks of 1650, a prime example of the industrial pioneering that made America what it is today. From this original works, iron masters and skilled workmen went forth to establish plants at Taunton and New Haven, at Concord and Providence, and later to other points along the Atlantic coast. The spirit of Saugus and the skills of Saugus men passed from father to son, from skilled workman to apprentice, and helped to win the War of Independence. The many centers of iron and steel production which serve America today represent the evolution and expansion of the industry from the early days of Saugus. Today, Saugus is not only the birthplace of the American iron and steel industry, but a prototype of American heavy industry in general. The works at Saugus employed 100 men. Today, the American iron and steel industry provides employment for about three quarters of a million men and women. Capital investment in Saugus was about $165,000. Today, the iron and steel industry represents an investment of over $16 billion. Saugus produced less than 175 tons of iron products per year. Today, some blast furnaces can turn out more than 3,000 tons of pig iron per day, and the industry has produced over 134 million tons of raw steel in a year. The ironworks at Saugus is no monument to a dead past. It is a reminder of the great advances which the iron and steel industry has made and will continue to make, helping to provide the sinews of our national security and the basis for our unmatched standard of living.